I will do a, a quick introduction. Let's start. Um, very welcome to, to everybody uh, to this event of the European Think Tanks Group. My name is Geert Laporte. I'm the director of uh, ETTG. And we are very happy that so many people uh, really took the trouble to join, the time and trouble to join us for uh, this event this afternoon. Uh, before I hand over to the panel and the moderator, uh, allow me to say a few words about ETTG, the European Think Tank Group, and uh, this event. For those who don't know ETTG, ETTG is an independent network of six leading think tanks in Europe. We have a secretariat in Brussels, and we have uh, the leading think tanks on Europe's sustainable development agendas, international cooperation and foreign policy agendas in the major capitals of the European Union. So we work on a variety of topics, ranging from the green transformation, security and resilience, uh, trade and economic cooperation, migration and mobility, uh, democratic governance, and other topics related to the Europe-Africa agenda. Uh, we facilitate dialogue, we organize several events, uh, and I think we have quite a strong convening power also with a group of some 350 experts in the different European uh, capitals and in Brussels. Uh, so this is uh, ETTG, and I would say, um, why did we organize this event? Uh, I think the main reason is that we are in very exciting times, not only because of COVID-19 and the major implications on Europe-Africa and the Europe-Africa partnership, but also there is a lot going on these days, as you probably know we've uh, tomorrow a mini uh, European Union African Union summit in Brussels and we just concluded a few days ago the post Cotonou negotiations and all this uh, is quite important also for the discussion that we will have today because today we will discuss the MFF negotiations the Indiki instrument the MFF negotiations that will also be going on and hopefully concluded by the end of this week, because there will be more discussions on this. And we will focus today on uh, the particular topic of the uh, neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument. What impact will this instrument have on Europe-Africa relations, on EU-ACP relations, and on the EU's international cooperation agenda in general? I would say that this is the background against which we wanted to organize this uh, event, uh, particularly at this time in uh, the year. So we will take stock today of the progress made with regard to the negotiations on the Indiki and the outstanding issues that still need to be resolved. And of course, we will also discuss how the programming process will be organized. Um, before I hand over to my colleague Alexei Jones, uh, ECDPM colleague Alexei Jones, who will moderate, who will facilitate the discussions and will introduce the different speakers. I would just like to uh, mention a few housekeeping rules. Be aware that this event is recorded. Eh? We uh, uh, do not stick to a purely uh, Chatham House agenda. We are too many. And it's good that also other people can have a look at the discussions of today later on. So. Uh, the record of this meeting will also be on the ETTG website. Um, we will also ask you to mute your microphone as much as possible, which will improve the quality of the sound. And please unmute your microphone only when the moderator will invite you to speak. And if you wish to ask a question during the question and answer sessions, you can send a message in the public chat. In addition to your question, Please also mention your name and organizations. That's always useful for the other participants in this debate. So on behalf of ETTG, we look forward to an exciting debate, and I'm happy to hand over now to Alexei Jones. Alexei. Thank you, Geert. Um, thank you for these uh, welcoming and uh, opening remarks. Uh, thank you also to you and uh, the ETTG team uh, for an excellent collaboration in organizing and setting up uh, this event, which I'm sure will be very exciting. And uh, I'm Alexei Jones, Senior Policy Officer at uh, ECDPM, and um, working on precisely some of these issues we will be talking about today. And it's an honor and a privilege for me to moderate 
uh, today's webinar with a, a great panel and on such an important and timely topic, uh, programming the NDK in a post-COVID era. An important topic indeed because programming uh, is a crucial decision-making process whereby the EU institutions, and namely the Commission and the EAS, will decide about the priorities, the modalities, and the financial amounts uh, to be allocated to uh, partner countries for international and development cooperation around the world. A timely topic, obviously, also because we find ourselves at a critical juncture between, on the one hand, the final stages of the negotiations of what will be the main EU instrument for international and development cooperation, the so-called NDICI, 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 still different ways of pronouncing it, but uh, this instrument will be a major innovation and uh, tool for EU international and development cooperation. And also, at the same time, we are just uh, beginning the, the, the programming, the formal programming exercise, which will define where and how much uh, resources will be spent for the period 2021-2027. So the challenges uh, and context of this programming exercise are unprecedented, so to say the least. Uh, not only are we in a more contested and volatile world where the EU's role and influence as a global player is under constant pressure, but also because sustainable development goals and global challenges altogether call for a significant upscale of the level of ambition and of action of the EU externally. And as if this were not enough in terms of challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic and its socioeconomic and geopolitical consequences bring even more complexity, even more uh, of a sense of urgency also and it seems quite clear now that the principal motto of this programming exercise will be global recovery and build back better. And in doing so, the EU will need to address the sharp increase in poverty and the resulting needs uh, in terms of human development from health, education, social protection, as well as to strengthen uh, preparedness and resilience for future similar crises. The EU will also need to promote a more interest-driven cooperation and advance its own strategic priorities. Uh, you know what these are. The Green Deal, digital transformation, economic growth, peace and security, migration. But while it does so, while it promotes its own strategic priorities, the EU should not lose sight of the spirit of equal partnership that it intends now to promote and the principle of country ownership that is attached to it. And an important element that should help the EU to strike a balance between, on the one hand, the promotion of strategic interests, country ownership and global solidarity, is to ensure that the EU programs and implements its cooperation activities through an inclusive and multi-stakeholder approach. And with that, I just framed more or less the key issues that uh, I would like us and the panelists and the audience all to engage and uh, address today. Human development, country ownership, multi-stakeholder approach, all feature among the priorities and principles uh, that should guide the programming of the NDK. Yet one key question, which is at the center of today's discussion, is to what extent will these priorities and principles remain prominent throughout the programming exercise? So that's the question. And in order to discuss, address, exchange and debate around that, we have a great panel with us today. Uh, I will briefly present our speakers and give them the floor in a minute. So Felix, Mr. Felix Fernandez Shaw, Director for International Cooperation and Development Policy at the European, uh, Commission, European Commission's DG DEFCO. Uh, you are also in charge of uh, leading the negotiations and also the programming of the NDK. Um, we also have with us Celia Cranfield, uh, Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at Concorde Europe, the European Confederation of Relief and Development NGOs. 
We have also with us Karine Nsudu, Director of the Africa Europe Diaspora Development Platform, ADEPT. And last but not least, Mr. Niels Kaiser, who's a senior researcher at the German Development Institute and also a fellow member of ETTG. So before I give the floor to our speakers, uh, I will just recall the basic uh, housekeeping rules that were also um, presented by Hertz uh, and invite all our participants to please keep your microphones off uh, so as to avoid any noise disturbance uh, through, throughout the, the webinar. And also invite uh, and, and strongly encourage the audience to use the chat box to react, to engage and ask questions uh, during the whole session. There will be a Q&A uh, session uh, at the end during which we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, and when you do put questions in the chat box, again, please present yourself, your organization, and also indicate if the question or the comments uh, you have is for a speaker in particular or for the whole panel. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to uh, Felix uh, to update us on where we stand with regard to the ND key negotiations as such, and also what are your key points uh, with regard to the programming exercise. Felix, the floor is yours. Hi, um, Alexei. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks to Hert and to uh, all of you, the ETTG um, and the colleagues for coming in in, in such big numbers. Um, I, I, I think I would skip my introduction and refer to Alexei's introduction. He did it very well. Uh, he said most of what I wanted to say. Um, including the three possible names for Ndiki. Uh, if you have a name for Ndiki, please send it over, uh, tell the parliament, tell the council, publish it somewhere. Uh, I, don't, I don't imagine the next seven years, spending my next seven years having my commissioner talking to a head of state or to a minister in Latin America or in Africa and saying, it's going to be great, we got Ndiki for you. <laughs> you know. It's a, it's a real non-starter. Um, thanks a lot. We are indeed in the finishing stages of the Indiki negotiation, but let me remind you that we still don't have an MFF. Uh, we're still hoping to get one, possibly by the end of this week. And, but I think that what we do know about what we have is the agreement between the Parliament and the Council to create Indiki. And now that everybody thinks this is a given, let's all remember that in the past, we had many instruments and the European Development Fund, which was extra budgetary. And let us all also remember that in spite of the different, uh, the different um, up and downs in the negotiations, which always happen, we have managed to keep a nominal, uh, I would say, quite good financing level uh, if you take into account when I started drafting Ndiki and proposing the MFF back in 2018, I was still in the HRVP cabinet and we all thought that with one member state less, it was going to be if we kept um, the financing nominal level and we kept Ndiki together and we managed to put the expenditure of um, Africa into the budget. And I think we've done that collectively. Let's see, we're still not there yet, as I said, but I think we are in a very good place to start, as you said, Alexei, yourself, a very important road ahead of us. Now, of course, the programming has started, uh, even if uh, um, the Indiki negotiations are not there yet, and we don't have a regulation to govern the whole, the whole process. But of course, we all know that Senegal will always be there and that we will have a bilateral international cooperation and development budget with Senegal. So we don't need to wait to have the physical negotiations finalized. We are already working and talking with the Senegalese government in order to see what is it that they want and what is it what we want for the next seven years in our bilateral development uh, relationship. Um, <clears throat> the uh, road ahead, uh, as you, I think, said in your invite, uh, 
the um, the programming has been launched. We've been working for quite some time on what we call the pre-programming, having a first, uh, uh, let's say, dry run of what we think should be the priorities. And I think you have stated them quite well, Alexei, uh, the Green Deal, uh, peace, governance and human rights, migration, jobs and growth, and digitalization. But I think you've uh, probably it comes from uh, you know reading, reading a bit uh, uh, a lot of the let's say commission literature, which comes in very handy. But I think uh, there are a number of other issues which we're not going to stop doing because this is what needs to be done, and also this is what our partners are demanding uh, that we do, and that is of course human development. Education, health, social protection, this is, of course, uh, still there uh, and still very much in need. I think digitalization is a strong angle also to inequalities, and we will have to deal with that. Um, and I think those are priorities that we want to do. I think the other two or three basic elements that we want to promote with Ndiki in the next years our first, as you know, the geographization principle. Precisely this morning, uh, Kuhn and I were speaking to a colleague from a member state, a prominent colleague from a member state, who was asking us about geographization. And all this talk about geo priorities, thematic priorities, and who, go, who does what, where, and why. And I think what we have proposed in Ndiki is that the large majority of the programs go geographic however what we mu we must lose sight of is that when they land in a country their landing is thematic and this is a matrix mix that is culturally complex to implement because we come from a system who had which had many geographic programs but also many thematic programs um, we have to implement it in a way and program it in a way that not only responds to our priorities, uh, but also responds to partner countries' priorities. Uh, and, and, and that needs to be thematically, let's say, thematically squared. Uh, and I wanted to, 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 to make the point, because I know that there's many, um, there's many comments out there about the thematic priorities of the Commission and the programming. And I think um, I don't think they, they, you know, they've evolved, as you have said yourself, but let me, let me reassure everyone, once you land geographically, your landing is thematic. Uh, you, you, you do digitalization in a country. You work on human development in a country. There are, of course, some exceptions. There are programs who do not have, which do not have a real country landing because they are, um, they are uh, global by nature. They, they look at global issues. And there are also some specific thematic programs which we think we want to keep uh, a bit separate uh, from the geographic landing. I'm referring to the human rights and democracy and to the civil society programs continue to exist. I think which with a, a, uh, a level of funding, not sure yet whether it will be uh, uh, more or less than the present one, but I think the fact that they exist and that the Commission proposed them, they continue to mean not only that they're important for us and they're important for who we are and what kind of societies we want, I think they are important for people in our partner countries and that's why we keep them separate from the um, from the uh, geographic programs. I would also add that as we've started programming, apart from the principle of geographization, we need to look a bit more now into how to do it better with the member states. Uh, I did, when I was in the European External Action Service some years ago, I did the programming for the present MFF. And at the time, working with member states was a, as Kunduns, my DG today, would say, then it was a nice-to-have. Today is a must-have. 
not only because we've written that in the regulation, but because if you look out there and you look at how how it's coming, you look at the new actors, you look at the new um, the new paradigms, you look at the new priorities. There is very difficult to understand that we're going to do things as the European Union alone without the member states. And that's why we not only have promoted joint programming, but we have promoted Team Europe. Uh, you've seen Team Europe in the uh, response to COVID. This has now been, uh, uh, I would say, quite successful. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, open to, to comments and suggestions. And we are looking into extending Team Europe more widely. In fact, the uh, Council under the German presidency has agreed on a text on Council conclusions. And I say it institutionally correctly, they have not yet agreed on Council conclusions. They have agreed on a text on Council conclusions that enshrines Team Europe and the Team Europe approach as a functional way ahead for our work uh, in the future. And I think it's important to note that we don't need to get obsessed about joint doing things, doing things jointly. Um, uh, we need to be access, uh, more obsessed of doing things as a team and uh, pre presenting and promoting Team Europe as a way of doing things and a way of increasing our influence and our impact at country level. The last element that I would add, uh, and with this I would like to, to finalize, is uh, the, um, the fact that uh, Endiki brings together all the uh, existing instruments, not only the regulations, but also the instruments. And that not only goes for the grants, it goes for the loans, the guarantees, the technical assistance, the external lending mandate of the EIB, the ACP investment facility, the EDF, everything is in there. And this has led us to reflect uh, on whether we could work together with the EIB. We could work together with the guarantees to promote reforms, to combine our budget support um, with other forms of implementation on investment, where we could also combine it with civil society and how the civil society will participate into those pro programs. So that is, I think, the third big element, is how do we combine what we do and then what we do with member states to reach further impact, to reach more people and to become, I think, and to have our policies uh, um, be more visible and more influential when they land at, at country level. Um, I would leave it at that, probably by maybe summarizing it all by saying you will have seen that Commissioner Urpilainen is the Commissioner for International Partnerships. And you will also have seen that DG DEFCO is changing its name to DG International Partnerships. And I think this, I, I saw in the preparation for this, um, for this uh, video conference, I saw one of the things that you want me to talk about is ownership. I imagine ownership by partner countries. Well, I think we say it all. The change from development policy name to international partnerships says, I think, and translates very well, what is it we want to do? We want to be partners at international level. I, I'll keep it at that because I think what we want now is to open to the rest of the panel and then get some questions. Thanks, Alexei. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, thanks for all the points you made. I, I did pick up the, the thematic landing uh, of, of uh, priorities, so I think that would be a, a good also point uh, for others to react. But I will now give the floor to uh, Celia Cranfield uh, from Concord uh, again. So any uh, reaction, quick comments you have to what we just heard, but also some uh, points you may want to make on the three key issues uh, we are focusing on today. Celia, the floor is yours for seven minutes. Thank you, Alexei, and, and thanks to the European Think Tank Group uh, for inviting Concord to this discussion. I think it's quite an important one. Um, it's been great to listen to Mr. Fernandez Shaw. Uh, I was hoping to get even more of an insight on how these final weeks and days of negotiation on the Indici are going. Um, as a network, we've been trying to influence this process for, for three years, and so we're looking forward to an end point. I imagine the Commission 
even more so, uh, not least because this COVID context is a poor time for the EU to be facing delays in programs and unpredictability as a partner. I think Alexei said it very well when he said it, 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 it's a, a process of great complexity and urgency at this point. Um, as for a name, we could maybe come back to it. I think Concord would have liked to see it called the Sustainable Development Instrument. So I'll just throw that out there while I'm here. So I've been asked to speak about human development and country ownership and multi-stakeholder partnerships. It's a lot in five minutes. Um, I'll try and focus mostly on the, the specific moment we're in now with this COVID context and the, the programming uh, from a civil society perspective, obviously. So since the proposal from the NDICI came out, Concord has been calling for actually strengthening the allocations on human development and the thematic program. So hearing uh, the Commission really emphasising that point just now was was, was quite encouraging. Um, but I think in terms of addressing the direct and indirect uh, effects of the COVID-19 response and recovery, it's shown us how important it is to actually invest in health, water, sanitation, social protection, and to address inequalities and focus on women and children. So we hope to see that the final agreement on the NDICI will commit to at least 20% uh, on this human development. I, I think these sectors, they help us to respond to the current pandemic, but our demands on this or our expectations on this are, are more longstanding because those are the ones that fit well with delivering on the SDGs for those left further behind where we see um, that ODA is such of such great added value. But we've also seen in the past programming efforts that the thematic lines are crucial as complementary tools to support the, the different sectors on different levels from the very local to the global. And so we've been disappointed, I would say, so far in the negotiations on the NDICI not to see the funding lines for the thematic boosted. Um, and so I very much hope this, this geographic programming exercise will deliver what uh, Mr. Fernandez Shaw was saying. It has to be a very smart and inclusive process, I think, to really capitalize on, on what different actors can bring to the table um, to compensate for those changes in the EU's instruments. And so that brings us now to the, the current programming exercise. Um, as Concord with our members and partners, we've been trying to capture the degree to which civil society has been including in the programming consultations, but also to support it. We've done quite a lot of outreach and we know that delegations will consult um, and it's it's obviously a bit too early to tell, but from the information we've received so far, the results in terms of sort of a meaningful and inclusive consultation are quite mixed. Um, there are still many delegations that are reaching out only to the usual suspects in terms of their civil society partners. And that's despite having quite useful roadmaps that could bring them in a different direction. Or they've invited civil society with very little advance notice or information about what was actually the subject of the consultation. I think there are some some easy fixes on that. You know, there could be sharing of the outcomes of the pre-programming process, for instance. Um, but I think that's actually that poorly prepared consultation is frustrating for everyone. For civil society, probably feels like a tick the box exercise. For the delegations, then they don't get what they need from civil society. In fact. Um, but there are some good examples too. I just read something in my inbox yesterday that came from Kenya that looked really, really encouraging. And I think in theory, this COVID context of having mostly a digital format should enable reaching out further than the capitals, for instance, um, where the infrastructure allows, obviously. Um, but we are a bit concerned that because of the, the constraints in format, but also because of the public health situation and the constraints in time, because we've been very delayed with this programming process, but the final, the points for the delivery of the documents from the Commission side haven't really moved, um, that the consultation round won't be as meaningful and impactful as it should be for what is a multi-year programming process. Um, and given that the thematic programs are also quite limited in their scope <laughs> and the bulk of the CSO's partnership, as Mr. Fernandez Shaw was saying, will be through these geographic programs and the new Team Europe initiatives, I do think these consultations need sufficient time and space. Um, so perhaps the EU delegations need more guidance on this. I'm not sure. I understand each country context is specific, but I think we could do better here. Um, it's something Mr. Fernandez Shaw mentioned. It's, it's, there is a kind of a tension in this current round of programming between the EU strategic priorities and uh, the idea of country ownership, which is 
obviously very important in a kind of policy driven development cooperation. Um, I've seen it through different conversations in programming. Um, I do wonder what effect it will have in terms of the sort of long term development effectiveness in the long run. Um, but more importantly, I do think it also sort of underscores this need for proper consultation and to give the time to square, I think you said square the circle on this. I, I think it, 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 it's quite a complex exercise. So lastly, on country ownership, I mean, we've seen in the current context that COVID um, has been a sort of factor in shrinking civil society and democratic space. And that's come on top of several years of an increase in the numbers of countries that are sort of uh, contested states, fragile environments, conflict, human rights abuses. And I think civil society can actually be a strong partner in oversight and in also shaping the Commission's priorities to a given context to ensure that sort of broader understanding of what uh, country ownership can mean beyond state authorities. Um, so, and, and equally, actually, the, the, the sort of the, the Commission's priorities can be seen through the lens of enabling civil society space. You know, if you take digitalization and the regulation of digital media, um, how is that either furthering or shrinking the voices of grassroots movements, organized labor and so on? So I would urge that we continue to reflect on, on broadening this notion of country ownership and, and give the space to civil society in, in the EU's sort of development of its priorities for any con context. I did want to finish with one question, um, which was in the, the recent agreement on the MFF, there was this one billion uh, of reflows from the EDF to be allocated to the NDICI. The Commission had previously put forward a proposal about re reflows from the EDF. Um, so I was wondering what scope there is for the Commission to propose that that one billion be allocated uh, to the thematic programmes actually in this NDICI. I think this would help uh, rebalance a bit the proportional cut that there has been on the thematic lines in favour of the geographic programmes and in favour of flexibility. For the commission um and i think in this context covid context in particular and how it has exacerbated specific trends that would be very useful so i'll finish on that thanks alexei thank you very much celia thanks uh, for the points you made i think you covered all three topics so uh for that, uh, I actually would like to also maybe put uh, to the to the discussion uh, how to ensure that there is sufficient time, space, and possibility to to consult and have these uh, participatory processes in the given circumstances where actually physical meetings are more difficult. So how how can we make best use of also virtual tools to do that? Um, I will now give the floor to Karine Karine Soudou, uh, who will also uh, try to touch upon. Uh, some of the key topics. Um, Karin, the floor is yours again for seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you to ETTG for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I think it's a very interesting moment to talk about um, the programming of uh, the um, NDK, given that it will come into effect in 2021, which will be a, a very important year for um, EU external relations, especially when it comes to Africa, given that the EU-AU summit has been postponed to 2021, and that the, um, the, the agreement between the EU side and between the, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific uh, states will also come into effect, come into force in 2021. Um, I think that at the same time, uh, this conversation is very timely, given that uh, due to COVID-19, we have seen new um, issues emerge, um, new, challenging, new challenges uh, emerging, um, such as um, the need for um, the provision of vaccines and also uh, the need um, for a support for economic recovery, which means that um, the, the EU will have to uh, be able to um, provide a specific engagement in this respect uh, we, without neglecting the structural issues. Uh, when it comes to the, the three issues under consideration, um, so country ownership, we do believe that uh, programming should remain in line with um, the aid effectiveness principles uh, as stipulated in the, in the Paris Declaration. 
but also in the Busan Partnership for Effective Development, uh, which means that um, EU development cooperation should fully align with um, the development priorities of the partner countries. And here we can see a potential tension, uh, which was already in, uh, stressed by, by Celia and by Alexi, but between the policy first principle uh, that is to underpin EU external action and uh, the principle of, of country ownership. And in the same vein, uh, we wonder how the Commission will manage to strike a balance between the, the policy first principle and the mutual interest principle, uh, which is supposed to be uh, at the heart of the, um, the proposed EU comprehensive strategy with Africa. Uh, when it comes to uh, human development, to, to um, um, poverty reduction, uh, poverty reduction and sustainable development are um, some of the main objectives of the EU external action. And, and we think that it should remain the same, which um, should imply sustained support for health, uh, for um, education, vocational uh, training, social protection, but it, it, it raises the, the question as to whether investment, as um, focused, as emphasized in, in the NDK, um, are the, the appropriate funding modalities uh, when it comes to addressing these uh, development challenges. And, and to us, it, it also begs the, the question of uh, the focus on migration, given that uh, a, a target has been set when it comes to migration. And, and the question is to know if the funding dedicated to migration will mainly cover uh, border management, security, or mainly address what we call uh, the, the root causes of, of migration. Um, another question related to migration is um, how the EU will manage to properly uh, integrate the nexus between migration and development in EU development cooperation. Uh, lastly, when it comes to inclusiveness, so we, we, we do believe that uh, in tune with, uh, with Busan, that I mentioned before, and, and also with the uh, SDG 17. So we believe that a fully inclusive approach should be preferred, uh, that multi-stakeholders partnership moves, uh, should be strongly supported, given that we know that um, a good collaboration between uh, civil society, between think tanks, between local authorities, private sector, can lead to um, innovative approaches. Uh, we can already see that when it comes to the private sector, um, on top of, of course, the trade and investment, we can see that uh, the private sector can provide a very effective support to entrepreneurship development, which is particularly important in, in Africa. And uh, uh, as you probably know, um, the Tony Lumelu Foundation has been very active in this respect. Uh, we also uh, believe that a, a, a greater importance should be given to diaspora. Uh, we know that uh, remittances are the largest source of external financing for low and middle income countries, that so the remittances exceed ODA, uh, and that it is very important to find a, a more effective way to, to involve diaspora in development cooperation. Uh, and we think that um, the EU should find a way to uh, not only tap into a diaspora financial capital, uh, be it remittances, investment uh, on philanthropy, but also um, to tap into human capital of the diaspora, for example, when it comes to knowledge uh, transfer. And to this and uh, we believe that uh, clear guidelines should be developed. Uh, it was already the case for civil society, uh, and, and we are convinced that uh, the 
the, the Commission uh, can can elaborate uh, such uh, guidelines. Um, on top of this issue, I wanted also to raise um, the, the question of the geographic approach. Um, I think that the current situation uh, with the COVID-19, uh, the fact that um, collective action has been appraised for its uh, effectiveness, that it calls into question this, um, this geographic big approach, uh, I prefer using this term, because so far um, thematic programs have funded, um, for example, uh, Gavi, uh, the Global Fund, and, and we think that it's very important to have uh, thematic programs well funded um, in order for the EU to be able to, to properly respond to global challenges, and, and COVID-19 is a good example. Yes. Um, another question that uh, deserves to be raised, according to us, is um, to know how the NDICI will enable um, a stronger EU-EU partnership uh, at a time when Africa is diversifying its partnership uh, with China, of course, but also with uh, Turkey, India, and so on and so forth. And that, um, on the other hand, uh, there is no dedicated financial instrument or no dedicated program for continental Africa. And, and this applies also to the EU ACP relationship, given that with the creation of the NDICI, the EDF will disappear. And so there will be um, no financial vehicle for this partnership. I will stop there for the moment. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Karin. Um, thanks for, for the, all the points you made. Um, and I think what comes up also uh, in echo with what uh, Celia said earlier is the need for clear or clearer guidelines on how to involve different uh, stakeholders. And you mentioned uh, explicitly private sector. We also had a question on that and, and in particular the diaspora. So maybe we could also keep that for the discussion later. Uh, I will now give the floor to Niels, Niels Kaiser, um, who will uh, also say probably a few words uh, on, on the issue of uh, country ownership in particular uh, and development effectiveness, uh, also linking that with some of your recent work on these topics. Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexei. So um, I asked Alexei if I could be the last speaker because then I could present when it's dark outside. You rarely get to do that. Um, let me just the remarks I prepared um, just on the name. So there are three schools. Huh? You have Ndiki, you have Ndici, and you have NDICI. Um, a couple of years ago, especially around 2018, people were still referring to the single instance. So I always thought it had a nice, mysterious and fundamental ring to it. So I might even refer to the single instrument a couple of times. Um, but yeah, uh, I have a couple of general remarks and then indeed, as you announced, Alexei, a few observations on ownership. Um, normally in panels like these, you say that, that this discussion is timely and it definitely is, it might even be timely because indeed the, uh, the regulation is still under negotiation um, and our seven year budget framework is being held hostage by two of our member states. Uh, so, we will only know by the end of the, the, the week and hopefully a bit sooner uh, what will happen um, to both. Um, so maybe this is what what's being a Brexit commentator is like. You have to uh, talk about what you know, but there's a great deal that, that could still go either way. Um, maybe to start that the single instrument, the Ndiki, represents a fundamental reform for the EU's development policy, its neighborhood policy and its external action more broadly. Uh, we have regional and thematic approaches, specific modalities that until recently lived their separate lives, now sharing a, a single legal roof. Um, and that implies a steep learning curve, which has been quite challenging uh, to make during the past few months when most of us were stuck at home talking to screens. Um, also, when it comes to the pre-programming, it, it should not be overlooked that a lot of uh, uh, the EU officials based in the EU delegations were not actually at the EU delegation. So many of them were also understaffed and were faced with uh, uh, the challenge of preparing the programming uh, for an instrument that at that time 
uh, was not yet certain because we we weren't yet certain about uh, um, our next EU budget until July this year, and and we're still not certain today. Um, the Andiki covers several policy areas. It comes with a lot of new jargon and new framing, like like projecting European values, uh, putting Europe on the geopolitical map, um, and so on. And it's interesting that the process of determining our priorities and financial allocations is still referred to as programming, which is a rather classical verb from the EU's development policy dictionary. Uh, and in this case, maybe just to say, programming refers to analyzing the national development priorities of partner countries, uh, and on that basis determine the focus of the EU's cooperation engagement. And indeed, it was mentioned, maybe the most important change is that where before programming was about determining where the grants were going to mainly, uh, now it is about uh, um, various forms and, and, and ways of doing cooperation, ranging from grants to uh, blended finance, uh, the use of the external action guarantee, uh, the provision of additional technical assistance, especially to uh, upper middle income countries who are rich enough to finance their own development, uh, but can tap into these. So that's all quite different. And it means also that compared to earlier times, programming now is already to a large degree about choosing modalities. So we're not just determining um, uh, the what of cooperation under the current program, but also the how. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of expectation management challenges that we're now facing and also some uncertainty. Uh, and maybe uh, let me comment on one of them being country ownership. So that term ownership appears 11 times in the proposed regulation. And that continues a tradition within the EU's development policy in terms of emphasizing the importance of ownership uh, and emphasizing that the EU is not a member state. It doesn't uh, face an uncertain parliament every year in terms of determining a budget, but can prepare the financing uh, uh, over multiple years. Um, realizing the ownership ambition in the context of the new instrument uh, will be challenging for three reasons, as I see it. So first, because of the way in which it is defined and to a certain degree misunderstood. Uh, secondly, because of the relationship with the Team Europe initiatives combined with the practical uh, um, COVID-19 related challenges that were already raised. And third, uh, for the trade-offs with the spending targets that are embedded in NDKI. So first, maybe uh, a basic law of development cooperation and external action in general is that it is relational rather than technical and that the strength of that relationship determines the results ultimately. And uh, maybe Understandably, because it is linked to uh, the preparation of the next seven years, the Andiki regulation uh, ha has a more static understanding of ownership that is linked to the national development priorities of developing countries or other existing strategy documents, or basically things that are on paper already. Uh, in practice, ownership is however not something that is confirmed at the beginning of a seven years period and is then present until you start the next round but it's uh, an outcome and a property of the development cooperation relationship. Uh, it should be shared by uh, a lot of actors that are all involved in the cooperation. And as a result, also that ownership will ebb and flow and will evolve over time, which is also why you should monitor how that ownership evolves rather than just checking in the beginning whether based on the document you can confirm it as being there or being absent. Um, so, it's good that the Commission remains committed to the development effectiveness agenda, uh, um, but it should also um, acknowledge the, the, the limitations to promoting ownership at this moment uh, due to the understaffed uh, uh, delegations, as I mentioned. Um, linked to this also is the question of to what extent promoting ownership of the EU's development policy within the European Union uh, leads to tensions with promoting it with its partners. So the EU's portrayal of, of Team Europe has evolved from ensuring a rapid collective financial response to COVID-19 towards emphasizing large and visible Team Europe initiatives, which are joint flagship projects that involve the EU, selected member states and some of our banks. Uh, the wider Team Europe agenda has the potential of strengthening Europe's commitment to its collective effectiveness, but to an extent also it makes the effectiveness process more um, supply driven and, and maybe more Eurocentric in a way. And you cannot give the dynamics to the partner countries at the same time, uh, intensify your discussions and preparations at home. Um, 
in addition, maybe something that wasn't mentioned yet, a key part of the Ndiki is the creation of a flexibility reserve. So the potential for the EU to respond to unforeseen events at a later point in time in the seven year cycle. Um, yet the use of that reserve should strive to, to fulfill the same country ownership ambition uh, as the decisions that are being prepared now rather than being decided uh, unilaterally by the EU actors. Lessons can be learned from how we used the European Development Fund Reserve uh, in the past few years uh, to create things like the EU Trust Fund, uh, uh, which um, confronted uh, um, some ownership challenges along the line, let's put it that way. Finally, then, uh, a challenge with promoting ownership is also the trade-off with the spending targets that are in the regulation, including those concerning human development and social inclusion, climate action and migration-related expenditure. Now, various actors consider these individual targets to reflect important priorities, but together they might condition the EU to identify cooperation areas where several of these input targets can be combined, which is understandable, but also comes with some, um, with some ownership risks. Um, maybe just my, my final remark for now um, would be that, uh, um, it's good that, I mean, from a communication perspective, the, the geographization principle is, is equally problematic as Ndiki, of course. So we need to think about that as well. Um, but what that, what that geographization principle uh, reflects is this focus, this refocusing on, on bilateral cooperation in, in the EU. Um, that might run the risk, taking the national development plans as a basis to emphasize those sustainable development goals that are located within the borders of countries. So health, education, uh, um, among others. And that might lead to a neglect of those challenges that can only be addressed uh, uh, by different countries working together. It's, it's obvious that, of course, if you ask countries, then those common problems that they each face individually are the ones that are, the, uh, that are mo most clear and present danger uh, from a political perspective. And it's important to see how in the programming those collective uh, problems do not get neglected. That was all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. And uh, thank you very much to all, all panelists, all three and all four of you. Uh, we've had in the meantime quite an uh, important number of questions, which we'll get to uh, in a minute or in a few minutes, uh, Felix. I will just before we enter the Q&A session, uh, properly, uh, just give you the opportunity to uh, react, respond to some of the points that were raised by our, our panelists uh, on some of the issues, so, I mean, among others, but needs just touched upon, and um, Karine also on the, the, the difficulty of uh, squaring that circle uh, due to the geographic or geographization principle or geographization approach. Uh, and how that links also to the, the priority that needs to be given and which you also emphasized uh, to maintain on the, the core priorities, thematic priorities. I think that came back up, so maybe some, some clarification on that. Um, yeah, and I think probably also what we would like to discuss uh, in more detail is also the, the question of uh, the involvement and the participation of, of other stakeholders, which uh, has received still, I think, a mixed experience uh, so far. So, Felix, I will give you five minutes to respond first and foremost to the the points, five minutes, yes, to the points made by our panelists, and then we will uh, get into the Q&A, and I'm sure we will have an opportunity to provide further details on those same issues in the, in the question section. Thanks. The floor is yours, Felix. Okay. Thanks a lot, and thank for some of these um... I mean, these questions are, they're not difficult to answer, they're difficult to tackle, because this is exactly um, the whole the whole point of many of them. Um, I mean, the, the, the dilemma between uh, thematics and geographics, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's not a it's it's a false dilemma. It's I think it's more an administrational issue, uh, a budgetary issue, and a constituency issue, rather than you know, uh, is it is this one better or worse? Um, I don't think there's better or worse. I I think that we have opted for one, 
um, which is to to land most of the things we do at country level and keep only at global level what does not have a real uh, let's say country landing um, and therefore you know uh, uh, we can we can work around this uh, argument endlessly but what it is what is true is that um, it's very difficult to for example criticize uh, the Commission or whomever for saying that there's not sufficient ownership, but at the same time, plea for a 20% human development target. Uh, and, as, and as Niels was saying, a 30% climate change target um, and a migration target for, for that matter. Um, you know, I think it's good to set priorities. But then it's good also to understand the dynamics or where and how those priorities are going to be more effective. And we firmly believe that those priorities will have to be effective at country level. And that's why we talk to the countries and, and um, uh, uh, we know um, that uh, uh, this is always an issue because, you know, countries may our partners may want to do things that are different. And depending on which thematic sector you sit in, you may love what they say, or you may think it's not the right thing. And that's where we're coming from also when it comes to the development programs, etc. You know, writing the Ndiki is always a little art effort, because what you really have to write in legal text is the basic principle of I want to work in Senegal. I sit with the Senegalese and, you know, this is what they want. This is what they have prioritized in their national development programs, in their political programs. There can be a government program adopted by parliament, which is not called the national development program. And then we have to see which are the issues on which we have not only a priority, but we also have, I think somebody somebody was saying it, we have the staff and the qualification to do it, because it's very fine for a country to say, I want to do education with you if I don't have any education experts in the delegation. Um, so all these things, you know, need to come together. That's why we have strong thematic units here at country, at, at headquarters, to give support um, to delegations. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worried as to the capacity of the EU and the Commission and the EAS to implement at country level thematic priorities. I, I would side with you in, in making sure that, um, that, you know, as we start landing the programming and starting the implementation, um, that we really, uh, really do what we set out to do. Huh? And, and this is where we have to be. Probably that is my role as the overall coordinator of Ndiki and the programming is to make sure that, oh my gosh, everybody has said renewable energy. We, you know, because there is a hypothetical possibility that everybody says, we want to talk to Europe about renewable energy. And wait a minute, what about, what about gender? And, and what about... Uh, and, you know, so I think we have to we have to make sure that that happens. But you know, the fact that the money is sitting in a geographic or in a thematic, I think, is less important than the fact that we will have to run a monitoring uh, system. I mean, it looks like a grand scheme that Felix has in his head. Wrong is we just need to keep track of what are we doing where so that we're sure that we're doing what we want to do, what we set out to do, and what our partners are asking um, us to do. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be too worried about the geographic uh, thematic. Where I would be a bit, you know, uh, and thanks, uh, Celia, for your comments on, um, on the civil society. Listen, uh, I, I am right now the director in charge of civil society. I will no longer be. You may be sad, but Gert and Alexei will be happy because I will now be the director in charge for think tanks. Good. Now, 
Um, you know, one of the things that we're very much worried about is not only the civil society, uh, you know, reaching out to the civil society and, and being able to implement projects and priorities through them. Um, as, the, as the world and, uh, you know, the, the whole reality becomes more complex, uh, the digitalization, uh, you know, the challenges related to the Green Deal, and yes, you know that people talk about, people in Europe talk, and by people I mean, you know, the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, talks about the twin green and digital transition, but she also talks about the Fair Transition Fund. Um, and she talks about, you know, who, how are we going to do this? These are really incredible, incredibly complex matters. Um, and it's, it's, I think, you know, we're going into a, a world which is going to get more technical, more complex. And one of the priorities that I think we should be having is vis-a-vis -vis the civil society is one, to monitor accurately the shrinking space. As you said yourself, COVID is, cannot be a good excuse or, or even a bad excuse. Uh, for that, so we have to monitor that. But the second thing we have to do is we have to enhance the capacity of the civil society to follow these conversations and intervene. I don't know, uh, you know, I mean, I, as you can all see, I'm getting into a certain age. Um, you know, it's quite difficult for me to follow the word, uh, the world of the Green Deal the transition from fossil fuels into renewables, the complex socio-economic challenges of shifting to zero carbon. Uh, you know, we all thought that doing video conferences and teleworking was a horrible invention. Uh, this we thought until only February. And here we are. We're all digitalized and we're not aware of the complexity that means. I think the civil society, if the civil society wants to play the role it, it belongs to the civil society in, in the society as a participant, if transitions, if options, if national debates are going to be participated by the civil society, the civil society needs to know what we're talking about. And frankly, Sometimes I hesitate to say that I know what I'm talking about um, when it comes to real some technical issues which involve choices between, you know, do we go natural gas or do we go renewables? Do we go broadband with, you know, connectivity? Uh, how many people? How do we make sure that women have access to an iPad? Oh, oh my God, you know, what, how do we make sure that they are trained and educated to be able to use an iPad for their inclusion in society, let alone health. So, you know, I think uh, uh, beyond the usual things, and that's the other, the other question that I normally get is now the Commission is talking about private sector investors, uh, renewables, yeah, wh what about the usual? And, well, you know, I think we are trying to talk about the things we need to learn and understand how to do, because we weren't doing them. Education we were doing, health we were doing, um, social protection we were doing, and we know how to do them. We don't know how to do other issues who right now come into our portfolio and we think are important. It is important to bring investors to, uh, to Africa, but we don't know how to do it. We never did it. But those who say, yes, but all of a sudden, you know, all this ODA dedicated to investment, I'm sorry, but nobody seems to remember that the external lending mandate of the EIB is also ODA. And the fact that it was managed by the EIB in the past and is now in Turindiki has not changed the priorities. It's just that everything is in Diki. In fact, it has made the work of the EIB more transparent and more accountable through Ndiki. And that goes for the EIB as much as it goes for KFW or for, um, for whomever. I Felix, see Alexei is getting worried about the timing. I just I can uh, see is, like, ask is, you to uh, 
wrap up on this if you have not done so already and we can move on to the to the Q&A. We have a lot of questions. Actually, many are also addressed to you. So uh, you will have the opportunity to to touch upon other issues or further detail yeah, yeah. some of that. I'm, um, I'm sure I will. But just one wrap up for uh, more specifically for Karin on um, the um, the uh, entrepreneur support and the investments. I, I want my, my point on ODA to investment was that one, Karin. But also, I think it's very important to support entrepreneurship in, in partner countries. But you know, that sounds simple. But in, 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 some, in some of our partner countries, there is no, I, there's no financial market. The banks, the commercial banks are not used to giving that entrepreneurship support because they run on a very low tolerance to risk. They're not used to taking risk. We need to promote that. We need to push that. One of the main, let's say, foundations of European society is that the bank takes risk. Takes risk. If, if they don't go out and take risks, there is no money circulation for entrepreneurs to do that. At the same time, entrepreneurs sometimes do not have the necessary training or formation to go to banks and present properly or plan proper projects. This is also something we should be doing. And I know, for example, in the civil society, you have ICA, the International Cooperative Alliance, who is really working on that through its all cooperational uh, cooperatives network throughout the world. And I think that's, that's the kind of thing we also need to think about. I'm done, Alexei. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Felix. So uh, many questions. Uh, I will try to regroup some of them um, in, in the order or try to link them to, to common themes. One that came up uh, is what are the major institutional changes and challenges brought about with the NDK, especially uh, bringing together the, the different communities, the different DGs, the neighborhood. How is this uh, working out? Um, and also uh, how this is working out in the field. Uh, and you mentioned the, the need to work with new partners, new players. So again, I think the private sector is, came, came up um, in the questions. So that would be one, from, for instance, the new ways of working and the new actors uh, working together. Another uh, series of questions touched upon the Team Europe approach and the Team Europe initiatives. And there was some... Uh, questions about uh, clarification of what is really new about the approach. Uh, if it's not just a, a renaming of, of um, old standing or quite ancient commitments on uh, coordination, division of labor, what is really new uh, and why, why more specifically the conclusions are still blocked. Um, so that's one. Uh, and I think probably another question would link to the response to COVID uh, and the, the initiatives that are taken in that direction, linked to, for instance, the, the Global Recovery Initiative, the links to, uh, to debt relief. Uh, how is this also progressing? So maybe the first round of questions would be for, for Felix, uh, but I also invite the other panelists uh, to, to react to what Felix just said and follow the discussion on that. Um, thanks, Alexei. Listen, I, I had the pleasure to join the European External Action Service in January 2011. That's almost 10 years ago. And I had almost the same question. How's the EAS going to cooperate with the Commission? Don't you think that the EAS... Uh, listen, I, I, I know that there's plenty of talk about whether DigiDevco talks to DigiNear, who does not talk to the EAS, who in turn does not talk to DigiDevco, and none of them talk to the civil society. Uh, it's a joke. It's not true. You know, it's just a large organization with different administrations uh, occupying different functions. Yes, Ndiki was meant, and this is what we did three years ago, when we started reflecting uh, on Ndiki, Ndiki will, will compel the whole external action machinery of the union to work together. It will, because we have a single instrument to manage. Of course, you can still argue, well, sorry, but you know, the program in Senegal is, is in DEFCO and the program in Ukraine is in Gijinir. Sure, that's okay. 
that's fine, but we still have to manage plenty of stuff. Um, you know, for example, we still will have to manage the EFSD plus guarantee thing together. We will have to manage the cushion together. We will have to have a common set of reporting and indicators, which I find very, very important in order to communicate jointly. And the EIB and the other implementing partners will have to, let's say, will have to come together because there's one Indiki set of reporting indicators, monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Under the new uh, organigram of DEFCO, that will all come under my uh, directorate. And my, let's say, behavioral commitment here is that I will try to make sure that everybody, you know, comes together in a single set and works together. Then, yes, there are obviously, you know, you can say that there are differences between DEFCO and NIR as much as there are differences between uh, two heads of unit in my directorate or between me and uh, directorate Ge director Geiger doing with human development. Yes, there are differences, uh, you know. Uh, there are, what can I say? We, we all people, we all think differently. Um, but then the other question, um, which I, I also think is important, is the new actors. And that links also with the Team Europe. Uh, you know, Team Europe is not only, is not the good old joint programming and division of labor. It's a bit more than that, because it's about not only deciding what is important um, and what is, you know, in our conversations with a country, what are the big things they really want to do? But it's also important to, to decide to, to work with them in a team from, from planning to design to implementation. And I remember when we launched a couple of years ago, the joint, joint implementation. You could see all the member states and everybody in the delegations all freaking out. Oh my gosh, this guy, you know, joint implementation, we're all going to do everything together. And they all got a bit more relaxed when I said joint implementation is not, is about doing, is not about doing things, doing one thing all together. Joint implementation is about taking a joint look at how we implement what we have decided. And then possibly doing that in a team. That's what Team Europe is about. Team Europe is about, you know, everybody deciding together with the partner country, this is what we can do. Everybody then, the components there, there are no selected member states. It's a voluntary thing. If you want to, con you want to contribute, go ahead. But then what's going to, what we're looking at is every component of the Team Europe approach will have to implement its own component. But we all work together. We have a team approach, we work together, and we have policy dialogue together. But then, you know, the technical assistance is run by AFD, the budget support is done by us, and the civil society component is done by ACED. But it's all in the same, um, in the same thing. Um, could, I, could I just come yes. in here and, uh, and maybe ask, yes, of uh, course. ask other panelists uh, to, to react on that? Because Team Europe, uh, if I also understand the, the concept or the approach, uh, is also the European family broader than the, the, the government or the development agency or the banks. It's also the civil society. It's also the private sector. And, and here I would like maybe to ask uh, Celia, Karin, but also Nils maybe on, on you know, what would be, uh, what is your experience, but maybe, maybe your suggestions or what is really needed to make sure that civil society component and private sector component are also fully involved in this Team Europe approach. Would any of you want to, to react to that? Celia, maybe. Thanks, Alexei. I think for us, this it, it, it's still a bit of an abstract question, actually. Um, the Team Europe initiatives at the moment seem very far away from civil society, either, either as a partner or is in terms of definition of the, of the priorities. And I think that comes back to my point also about the importance of this particular cycle 
of the programming uh, process and making sure it's inclusive to bring people into a, a condition where they can really talk about their, their the priorities, but also what role they might have in terms of implementation, in terms of support, in terms of shaping the policy and so on. Um, and I, I did want to respond to, to a few things um, Felix said uh, about the, the role of cis wolf society. My colleague Inga has put some, some comments in the chat, but also I think one of the wonders of civil society is also its, its diversity. Um, so I think the European Commission should not be so worried that um, there is no expertise within civil society on various technical questions. I think we all need a bit of humility about where are the limitations of what we know. Uh, but I think between uh, all the different types of civil society and the levels of grassroots movements and, and more organized forms of civil society, there's a lot of knowledge and capacity out there. Um, and the question is more is how does the Commission bring that in, both as a partner in implementation and, and dialogue, in a way that bridges the difference between the EU, a very sort of large bureaucratic institutions and the realities that the people working within civil society face. And I think that's that's a, a challenge for everybody to, to try and overcome that gap somehow. Um, there are specific things also on capacity that obviously are needed at this particular moment in time. You know, there are places where civil society really needs support technically. How could they counter um, shrinking space, digital, different aspects and so on. Um, I'm also a little bit less worried about the targets perhaps and 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 they don't think there's necessarily a contradiction um, on, on human development and, and country ownership. I think the targets that are there, most of them, um, probably not on migration, I would say, are very aligned with the, the EU's obligations um, and commitments on, on sustainable development and, and human rights and poverty eradication. Um, and they, they can only support, uh, I think, how, how that uh, development cooperation should work. And I would like to come back to a question actually a little bit on how um, this partnership of equals uh, really will look in the in the future, and and maybe not just with partner countries, but with with uh, the 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 other actors in in the field around them. Thanks. Thank you, Celia. Um, Karin, would you also want to react to the question, the questions we put forward? But also, of course, you have also read uh, some of the comments coming in, or what um, Felix has said. Yeah, yes. I, I wanted to ask a question concerning joint programming, uh, because I'm wondering how the DICI will allow better cooperation between the EU and, and its member states uh, on the ground. Uh, concerning um, Team Europe and um, the fact that it should be much more inclusive, um, my question is, uh, is the EU ready to open Team Europe to other stakeholders, knowing that it will probably make the processes uh, more complicated. Thank you, Karine. Um, Niels, actually, I would like, if I may, to come back to this uh, this point uh, on the on the tension between the the ownership and the targets, which I think is is some see there is a tension, some see there isn't. So I think you pointed to the fact that yeah, we need to find a careful balance uh, in that. Um, would you have anything to to say more on this? And also, you discussed uh, about the contradiction or the tension as well with the Team Europe. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe rather than attention, we could call it a trade-off. So, rather than saying um, you've got a lot of topics in your national development plan and we can we can take any of them to work on, it's likely that uh, uh, the EU will like to nudge them towards some of these priorities that are actually uh, covering some of these spending targets. I mean, to really overdo it, you would have. Uh, uh, border management programs targeting education uh, for climate resilience. I mean, the, you, you could think of kind of really, really weird projects that you are pushed into just to take the boxes. I really hope, um, and I think non-verbally Felix is, uh, uh, is confirming to me this is a joke rather than a, than a practice. Um, but, uh, but there is going to be a certain box ticking tension or, uh, I mean, that's maybe too negative a connotation, but but there's a need to be held accountable in these choices by these various spending targets that, that have been proposed by the Commission and external access service to be included in this legal basis. 
um, maybe on on Team Europe, um, maybe the big difference with the earlier division of labor complementarity approach is that in that earlier agenda, we put the initiative more with the partner countries. So it should be primarily under their leadership um, that the EU should engage in um, dividing labor and, and having each member state and the commission working on those areas of which the partner country concerned thought that member state had a comparative advantage. I think that idea is still very true, but was, I mean, it did not occur in many uh, places. Um, and that was always the bit that that was actually a tension between to what extent the EU should be coordinated or should coordinate itself. And that tension is still there and is also there in the Team Europe initiatives. Um, I still think that I have the impression, at least as somebody who is not an official actor and is not in all the meeting rooms, um, but that the initiative for having these Team Europe initiatives clearly comes from Europe. I mean, the name indicates that. Um, no, no doubt many countries would, would, would welcome certain flagship projects and, 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 and it's probably seen as, as, as helpful initiatives. I mean, to take the one on the, on the African uh, continental free trade area, for instance, um, that is welcome. Um, but I don't think there has been like, like a dialogue to, to determine the best possible topic for such initiatives per country. Um, but again, just my impression. Uh, just just going through the topics, um, uh, South Africa should be eligible under the regulation uh, because it was eligible under the development cooperation instrument before. Um, the NDICI should be the legal basis for cooperation with the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. But once concluded, the new uh, postcode new agreement would uh, rather structure the relationship, govern it, but actually the, the managing of the funds the legal basis for that and the decision making around it, that is the NDICI. Um, and that is, of course, a big departure from the previous situation where you have, where we had the European Development Fund as the dedicated means of implementation for the Cotonou Agreement and the preceding Lomé Conventions, as well as the funding of the uh, of the OCTs. Um, and there was one question also. Um, I mean, I think it was under PBOX where uh, the EU decided to, to increase its funding to regional organizations. Um, and that under NDICI, they actually go in the reverse direction um, where they um, have a lower ambition for directly funding regional organizations, but they rather uh, um, want to um, fund cooperation on regional topics, but that would rather be I don't know, um, Botswana and Namibia having a, having a joint project or something along those lines, rather than going through the door of COMESA or, or, uh, or ECOWAS to, to fund such cooperation. That's maybe from my side. Thank you, Niels. Uh, thanks. I will give back the floor to you, Felix, uh, maybe to respond to some of the points that just came up uh, in this uh, last round. Uh, and maybe just to follow up uh, on uh, on what Niels uh, just mentioned on the, the, um, the post-Cotonou. Uh, one question that came was, what actually are the changes foreseen? Uh, and that is also linked to the question of ownership, uh, not only in the, team, in the design of Team Europe initiatives, but the principle of ownership. Uh, what are the changes foreseen with the, 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 the budgetization of the EDF and all the, the approach uh, that was all the principles of uh, co-management and the role of NAOs, which, uh, which will presumably uh, disappear with that? So if you could finish with these, these few points. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, I, I have the feeling in, in some of these conversations that we're overemphasizing uh, a number of things that then, you know, it's, it's very difficult for me to be told that I'm not doing sufficiently ownership and then to be told that I only talk to governments, I don't talk to civil society locally. So we need to make up our minds. Um, you know, our instructions to the delegations is talk to everyone, you talk to the government, but you also talk to the civil society and to the private sector. Um, you can also talk to the European civil society if you have them there. 
you can also talk to the European private sector. Now, I reckon that this last element makes people a bit more nervous, but I don't see why if we talk to the European civil society, we should not be talking to the European private sector. But coming to the ownership point, um, you know, you can change all you want in the legal basis. Our political relation with countries stays where it is. Um, and, and we speak to the partner governments, we speak to the civil society, and then there's a balancing act between what a partnership is. A partnership between a partner, a government, a country, incorporating society, incorporating parliament, incorporating their overall political priorities, but also their needs, and how do they assess where uh, Europe would be better placed to support their sustainable development. This is what we do every day. This is what delegations are doing every single day. Then you need to have a conversation at some point of where do you do things best. And what we have realized in the past is that we can do a bit of everything everywhere, which is okay, because we don't know, we, you know, I, I don't think we, we, we are doing things that are wrong. But sometimes you're doing too many things, too thinly. And there has been, as Niels was maybe implying, there has been a conversation on Team Europe initiatives. Also, I think Celine said, um, well, you know, in some countries you br brilliantly speak to the civil society. In others, it's rather a failure, I would say, or she would say. It's the same thing with the donor coordination and the member states coordination. In some countries, the Team Europe initiatives have had a full-blown consultation locally, the government, the member states, the banks, everybody. In some others, somebody cooked it in their computer, uh, you know, uh, on the basis of their uh, best ability. You know, this is a large administration and we try, we try to, to do our best. And what we're going to do now is we have a, a year ahead to review the work and the conversations that have been and are taking place locally with the countries and with the societies and to start a phase of you know bilateral engagement between headquarters and the field bringing the member states uh, uh, bringing the member states on board bringing the civil society and our private sector from Europe on board and then uh, walking um, walking ahead with it. Um, I think the other uh, question that was on the chat that maybe um, you, you didn't say anything about, but I would like to say something about is, all this is very nice, but I need an MFF and I need an Ndiki. Uh, maybe I also need to change the name. But if I don't have Ndiki, I will not be able to put money uh, uh, in movement in 2021. And mind you, uh, with COVID and not only the sort of, let's say, the health issues related to COVID, which are different depending on the countries, but the socio-economic impact of the global crisis and its lockdown, the, the consequences of that are precisely the worst moment to, you know, continue the negotiations on the MFF for Europe. We all see what's going to happen in Europe but also for external action. It's exactly the worst moment in time to start talking and start having conversations about who does what where, when what I need to do is start having conversations with partner countries and start you know, putting the money uh, on the table to support the recovery. Last but not least, recovery is the question from Michaela um, and, uh, and also very happy to see lots of friends in the chat um, which I say hi to, uh, but um, you know, recovery is 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 going to be very complex, and not only in Europe, it's going to be complex all over the world. So yes, we do need to look at debt relief because you, we have a big debt sustainability issue, but at the same time, we cannot choke investment at the time when countries are suffering, and you know, we have to be careful with the debt discussion. And we have to be careful with uh, trying to bring investments. But, you know, it's all written. If you look at the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the financing for sustainable development, I think my line here would be, it's not all about 
keeping money in circulation and bringing money and investments and resources to partner countries uh, in development regions is also about investing in the right things because the and i'd like to finish with this the fantastic amount of money public money taxpayers money that we're going to put on the table in the next two years is unprecedented all the public financing that's going to put on the table at the same time is unprecedented well when my kids are will be my age they will continue paying that back and maybe when they are my age in say 30 years time they will say well it was fantastic because my father's generation took the right decisions and led us into a zero emission world and a digitalized economy that took care of the people. Or they would say, you know what? They screwed up. They continue invested in things that produce CO2. And here we are 30 years after paying and cleaning. That's where I think we need to talk about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Celia, Karin, and uh, Nils. Thank you all for your input, your contribution, also your responses or reactions to one another. I think that was also the intention of the of the exercise of this webinar. So thank you for all engaging. And thank you also very much to the participants who were uh, very numerous today. We had a lot of uh, comments, questions. I hope that more or less we addressed most of the points that were uh, put in the chat. Uh, and with that, I will, uh, yeah, I think, uh, reiterate what uh, Felix also said, that uh, none of this can actually happen if the, the NDK and the MFF are not finally approved. So uh, I think uh, probably the next few days will be crucial uh, to that end. With that, I will end this webinar, uh, not before thanking again all of you participants, but also the team, the ETTG team and ECDPM uh, colleagues who've been uh, very uh, helpful in the uh, setting up this uh, webinar, which I hope was also very useful for all of you. Um, and uh, if we do not see or speak to each other before that, I wish you a nice holiday uh, in the next few weeks. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Merry Christmas. Thank Merry Thank Christmas. Bye. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Hi, Felix. All the best. Thank you. Hey, so Haifa, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm you know, I should my give house, you a call and we lovely need house. Excellent. Whenever you want. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Felix. Cheers, eh? Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, James. Andrew, I see you in the chat. Bye, Felix.